Hi, welcome to Philosophy of Medicine. Uh, this is a series of lecture videos that are meant to support face-to-face uh, -face teaching for UCL's HPSC 3028 module uh, in Philosophy of Medicine. I'm Brendan Clark, I'm the module tutor for this, and I've been teaching it for about five years or so. Um, I am now a philosopher of medicine. I came to this very indirectly, um, initially from medicine. Um, and my reasons for moving from clinical work to, to thinking about philosophy of medicine were basic because I got interested in some problems that didn't seem to have straightforwardly scientific answers. Um, I think that's a pretty common path for people who end up interested in philosophy. Uh, a sort of uh, a last recourse uh, under under times uh, under conditions of great uncertainty, um, but actually, well, actually, we're, we're going to talk a bit about the kind of problems that I run into later on in this course, and um, particularly when we think about causation. Um, so anyway, so the philosophy of medicine module is um, a sort of introductory course, and it's meant for people who have some experience of either medicine and philosophy. Um, medicine or philosophy rather, but usually not both. Um, so usually roughly half the students on the module uh, have a background in medicine and biology and about half have a background in philosophy or philosophy of science. Um, so the rest of this video really is about explaining what happens in the module um, and about thinking of ways to, uh, I suppose, bridge the kind of gap in knowledge and experience um, that students on this module typically have, right? They, they either don't know very much about medicine or they don't know very much about philosophy. But that's fine, the course is designed um, for just that, those kind of cases. So anyway, so um, it's, the, the module is split into about half a dozen topics. We have 20 uh, sort of lecture tutorial sessions to cover all of those. Um, we begin in this session and the next um, with some very kind of introductory stuff, very introductory material thinking about philosophy of medicine and how philosophy of medicine works basically um, and that's uh, largely done by reading a paper by Arthur Kaplan which is about whether philosophy of medicine, this thing that we're, we're hopefully collectively going to be engaged in for the next couple of months, actually exists. Uh, so it's quite, quite a fun place to start. We then move on and talk about a kind of meaty uh, traditional philosopher, philosopher of science uh, topic, which is discovery, what discovery is, how we can understand discovery. Um, and my interest there is, as well as kind of giving a bit of an introduction to how philosophers think about this kind of quite important scientific question, is also to try and do some translation work. So most philosophy of science uh, is really about physics, or mm, traditionally has been about physics. And the examples that we think about when we read um, the kind of classic works on discovery are really no exception to this. They tend to be about physics or the physical sciences. Um, so there's some kind of translation work to do because I think the kind of instances of discovery that we look at in medicine might be a bit different uh, from what goes on in physics. Um, <clears throat> we then move on and think basically from the opposite direction. We think about a really, really classic philosophy of medicine problem. Um, which is about how we define health and disease. I have to kind of hold my hands up here and say that this is a problem that I'm not particularly <laughs> interested in, which, which sounds bad, and it's not meant, I'm not trying to be offensive or, or difficult. Um, it's more that I, I kind of have worries about how well this problem actually bears on practice. And I think for this kind of issue, where you're really looking at clarifying and developing an issue that's of great importance to practice. It's really of the first importance for philosophers to be able to actually say something of a lot that medics can care about. Um, okay, so it may be of interest to other philosophers of medicine, that's great, but I, 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 I suspect that uh, this is a case where I wish that philosophy of medicine in general was a bit more outward facing and a bit more inclined to deal with practice. I mean, just to put it very briefly, there are lots and lots and lots of cases in medicine where the issue of whether some, some condition should count as a disease 
is really, really important. Uh, so there's been a, there's, there's kind of a, a, a big row that's happened about things like chronic fatigue syndrome or Gulf War syndrome or lots of other kind of cases like these where there's really acrimonious dispute about whether a described set of symptoms actually should count as a proper disease and, you know, should therefore be, I don't know, treated by um, uh, national health systems or should entitle the sufferer of the disease to disability insurance or, or whatnot. Really important. And yet very, very hard to connect with a quite substantial debate in philosophy of medicine about what counts as disease. And that's weird to me. Anyway, so that's uh, that's that's coming up in about four or five sessions time. We then move into a third chunk, which is about causation. And causation is uh, kind of from both ends, right? So there's lots of philosophical work about causation and there's lots of medical work about causation. This has been a practical problem for medics of, of lots of different stripes. Um, and they've made some very uh, useful and interesting steps to try and deal with some of the problems about figuring out whether one thing causes another. What's interesting though to me is that the philosophers and the medics don't really line up and they don't really cross talk either. There's not much communication between two literatures, if you like two kind of parallel literatures that actually at their heart I think engage with very similar issues. So there's, I, I suppose this section is then a bit about joining the dots. Um, and reading some of the uh, contemporary historical medical work on how you figure out causation and then looking back into the canon of uh, philosophy, so looking back to, to Hume um, for some of the kind of more conceptual work uh, and then looking at more modern developments in philosophy of science, particularly looking at the mechanisms literature, which has been a big deal for general philosophers of science and for philosophers of medicine too in about the last 10 or 15 years or so. Um, we then move on to something a bit more practical, which is about models, the use of model organisms. Um, I mean, I, I think if you ask people what the, the kind of things that you're likely to find in medical research facilities, model organisms of one kind or another, Drosophila or mice or, or whatnot, um, are likely to be pretty high up on the list, I think. Um, that's fun for us because there's some really good philosophical work that's nicely lined up with actually the kind of roles that models are playing. Um, my interesting anecdote about this is that when I started doing medicine I was really really surprised that when you went into the, the anatomy teaching room where I really th which I really thought was going to be dominated by just kind of actual anatomical specimens right human human bodies for dissection I was really really surprised that there were many more models than there were actual real well i was gonna say real life but of course real dead uh real dead bits of uh, anatomy to learn from and I, I could it took me a while i think before i figured out that there was some kind of interestingly complementary role that models kind of idealized or, or abstract representations of real anatomy were not just kind of helpful in learning anatomy but were really really kind of essential to actually get to grips with what you were meant to be seeing. They were teaching you how to see anatomy. Um, and for a philosopher, that's really cool. And for um, medics too, I think there's some really interesting stuff in how you kind of understand and deal with the incredible complexity of medical systems. Um, after that, we're onto something that's a little bit less happy and a bit more controversial, um, which is about evidence-based medicine um, my current research is largely about evidence-based medicine and how you use evidence and how you rank evidence to make better decisions. Um, and one of the things that we worry about in this research project, which is called EBM Plus, actually if you want to go and look it up, it's at ebmplus.org. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me is, is that there's a worry that the contemporary practice of evidence-based medicine is leading, is, is working in a very monistic way that is it's giving one single answer as to what kind of counts as good evidence and we have reason to worry i think that there are lots of instances where the usual best aren't the usual best answer isn't a very good one and i think there's good grounds to think that they're more pluralistic that is you know multiple good answers not an uncritical kind of relativism but instead of critical pluralism an idea that there could be lots of different ways of generating good evidence that could be compared, contrasted and used in 
appropriate circumstances will be helpful. Um, so this part of the course is about evidence-based medicine in theory and in practice and relating to some philosophical work about this pluralism thing. If you've never heard of that before, don't worry. I think that's uh, some, of the, some of the more conceptually challenging stuff that we do in this course. So we will uh, spend lots of time introducing all of that. We then move on to think about classification. Um, classifications are really interesting. Classifications of disease are even more interesting because they're incredibly fluid. Um, we, for example, keep reclassifying various kinds of cancers and there, there are some um, very good examples of the way that uh, sort of breast cancer and things have changed over the last few years and how those changes have, reflected, uh, have been reflected in different treatments of different kinds of cancer and so on. This is all very interesting stuff for the, for the kind of practically minded. Um, but it throws up this really interesting issue um, that we tend to think our, our classification somehow cut nature at its joints. This is the sort of slogan for having some kind of single best ideal uh, way of classifying things that, well, shouldn't change, right? How do we uh, square that kind of idea of, of classifying things in, in you know, some very good and robust way with the actual kind of rapidity of change that we see in lots of areas in medicine. So some nice stuff there on classification. Um, and then we move on, we finish the course with some more open-ended work on, on, on data and on evidence. Big data is massive in medicine, big data is massive everywhere, but it's particularly massive in medicine. Um, and some of the, the, the kind of uh, knowledge that's been thrown up by data-driven research has been actually responsible for these the kind of changes in, in classifications that we've seen all over medicine in the last few years. Um, so there's some material at the end of the course that's driven by thinking about data and how we can work with data as practitioners, as philosophers, or uh, as people who are a bit of both. Um, anyway, I think that's enough about the kind of the kind of material on the course. Um, for those of you who are actually sitting the module at UCL, there are various bits of assessment and things that we'll talk about in the uh, in the tutorials. But largely, I mean, the most important thing to note is that you'll be writing your own philosophical work about medicine and it's going to be fine. It will really be perfectly all right. Um, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing to worry about in doing this. Um, I'm going to um, end this session with uh, a few thoughts about what kind of philosophical work we're doing. And that's meant to set up um, the second video uh, in this series which is about the question of whether philosophy of medicine uh, actually exists. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Look forward to seeing you in tutorials and things. Um, do feel free to leave comments below. It'd be great to hear from you. All right, thanks for watching. Bye.